Um, welcome to the Work Crowd's uh, marketing seminar on the importance of good design in branding and marketing. So I'm today joined by a fantastic panel. Um, all freelance experts have come from a graphic design branding uh, background that are helping corporates, SMEs, and a variety of different agencies and businesses um, develop their branding strategy and design and really also looking at how they can help businesses during these difficult times. Um, it's a tough market out there for everyone, and this is why um, the Work Crowd decided to launch their marketing series, really to help businesses rethink and reboot their marketing strategy post um, COVID and as we ease out of, out of lockdown. And, you know, marketing is, is so fundamental to success of, of every business. And um, what we've been doing is covering over our seven part series is looking into every single aspect of that marketing process. And good design and good branding is something sometimes people overlook thinking, gosh, that's expensive. How do I do that? Um, well, today our panel are gonna tell us exactly how to do that and um, the steps that businesses, no matter how big, should be thinking and what steps they can take. So, is coming away um, hopefully with some really good Vicky who's joined us today she has over 15 years experience in brand consultancy and strategy she's helped a range of different businesses from BBC Fairtrade Clinique Ernst & Young so you know both B2B and B2C Nassis is um, a brand and graphic designer he's got over 12 years experience in B2B and B2C um, has worked for the likes of Amazon and um, agencies such as the Bright Hub and worked for many different clients. And Andrew is a graphic and digital designer with over 25 years of experience supporting SMEs, corporates, design agencies, and numerous different clients across all different spectrums. So thank you very much indeed for joining me today. Um, also, Lauren is here from the work crowd. I know a number of you may have spoken to Lauren, so she's here to um, pick up any questions that you may want to ask along the way. There is functionality um, uh, on the Zoom uh, conference webinar that you can add questions, so happy to take questions along the way. Um, the format of today is going to be more presentation style. Um, Vicky's going to lead that, talking about brand strategy initially, and then we'll probably save some of the questions for the end. Um, just as ways interested myself, um, I am the uh, CEO and co-founder of The Work Crowd, which is an online talent platform that connects businesses with talented freelancers across the whole marketing mix. So from designers like we have today to marketing strategists, PR professionals, content writers, um, they're all there to help businesses grow and develop their marketing strategy. I'm also the founder of a, another talent business called Hanson Search, which is a more traditional headhunting company specializing in mid to senior level recruitment. So um, Vicky, thank you so much indeed for joining us today. Do you want to kick off first of all, I know you're gonna talk a lot about um, sort of brand strategy and, and the initial parts of that whole branding design process. Yes, thanks Alice. Um, I'm just going to pull my presentation. So we were just discussing the technicalities of this before, so excuse me if you see some notes. Um, so I'll just share my screen. Okay. So, um, as Alice said, um, can, oh, sorry. Technical problems. So everyone see that okay um so um as alice said um i <coughs> a brand strategist and i help my clients um to communicate their brand through good design but also some really good brand foundations which is where the strategy comes in um so today i'm just going to talk through <coughs> i'm going to quickly talk about the importance of good design uh, just touch on that and then just reiterate what a brand actually is because sometimes people don't know exactly everything that goes into the brand 
and then you know what actually a brand strategy is and why it's so important to your business and what you need to do to ensure that you have a cohesive and effective brand so <clears throat> the importance of good design good design starts with this strong brand strategy it's it's the foundations you know you can have a nice design but having a good design is an entirely different thing. Something that looks nice but doesn't have your brand message or is very generic won't be very impactful and just won't engage the right audience. So it just won't be good. So your brand strategy um, is focused on building your brand um, and it will help you grow your business and create that perception and experience for your clients that will again just gain that trust and, and that emotional connection that's really important for your brand loyalty. So, <clears throat> sorry, a good design, it's not just the visuals, it's the whole process that I'm gonna talk through. The age old thing is, uh, but I have a nice logo, um, and, and many of my, and my clients work on the assumption that if they've got a couple of nice colors and, and someone's done them a nice logo, then, then that's great, that's all they need. But <clears throat> again, if it's something generic, then it can be quite confusing for your clients and your consumer, and it might not talk to the right people, which again will just lose interest and then lose engagement, and also lead to a lot of brand inconsistencies. And consistency is my favorite word. Um, it doesn't mean repetitive or boring, it just means cohesive. And <clears throat> if you haven't got a proper brand strategy, then it can get a little bit messy. Um, so I'm gonna talk through that now. So just quickly, the, the kind of, brand iceberg that we have here. Um, a logo is important um, and it is the kind of face of your brand and that includes your visual identity. So it's, it's all the pretty packaging that we, we talk about when we talk about design, which is the font and colors. But what's really important is the perception of your brand as well, especially in nowadays when it's all online and people can't kind of communicate so much with you face to face. So it's the what people think. So your key messages, your positioning, your vision and your mission and your values, which is just some of the key points I'm going to talk about today. It's all the rest of the stuff that kind of feeds into all the emotional connections that people will have with your product and service. So in essence, the brand strategy is the blueprint um, and it doesn't have to be war or peace. Um, it's just something that clarifies what you do and what you stand for and why people should care. And more importantly, why you care what you care for. Um, and it makes your vision and promise really clear. So I'm just going to talk about just some of the key elements that I think are really important in a brand strategy. Um, you can have many different elements, but I think these are the core ones that really help you define everything. So the first is your vision, um, and that's the future. So when people ask you, what, what, what do you want to be in five years time? This is kind of the vision of that. It's the dreaming element of your brand. So it needs to be really big and exciting and it kind of almost needs to be bursting with possibility that it almost feels impossible and it, it kind of makes everybody else excited and inspired. Um, so a really good example of that is Nike. Um, and I'm gonna use Nike throughout because I think it's quite a good case study. They're a really su successful brand um, and their brand strategy is so cohesive that they just haven't changed it for about 30 years. But the, the way that they've done it in the visualizations changed, but the core foundations have always stayed true and static. So their vision, even that says mission, is to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. And although that sounds that it's specific, actually they've got a caveat there which humanizes it and talks about the fact that if you have a body, you're an athlete. So they're bringing in the human element and the human focus into their vision. And it's quite big, it's talking about every single person globally, but because they're bringing in that caveat, they bring it down um, and it just starts to connect with you and starts to connect with their core audience. So if we go through to the mission, which is a lot of people talk about vision and mission in the same breath. And I think they're very, very different. So if your vision is the what, it's the what future do you want to create? Then the mission is how. Um, it's the present kind of what path you're going to take to get to that vision. Um, so it's the doing element. It's not the dreaming element. Um, it's where you talk about 
your purpose, what's your brand's purpose and what's the goals and objectives and then how are you going to do that, what actions are you going to take. Um, it can be a paragraph or two paragraphs, it doesn't have to be big, it just clarifies um, both internally and externally what, what actions you're going to take every day and, and how you're going to do it. Um, and it's really good thing to have for your tactical planning in the business, so any marketing campaigns and everything you're going to do, it's really good to keep coming back to this. So again, I'll, as an example, I'll come back to Nike. Um, they're very meaningful and again, their vision, which was about inspiration to every athlete in the world, within their mission here, they talk about how they're going to do that. Um, they create groundbreaking sport innovations. They make their products sustainably. They build and create a diverse and creative global team and make positive impact. So that's the kind of how they're going to get to their vision. Um, and also, which I'll talk about shortly, is their values are kind of interweaved through that as well, and they use keywords throughout. And you'll notice actually that Nike don't talk about their products within their advertising or their campaigns. It's all about the human element. So again, that's because they've got a cohesive brand strategy, which is all about empowering and then it's all about the individual that allows them to change their efforts and to change their photography and to change their messaging and sometimes their audience, but their core values and their core message runs throughout. So just to clarify quickly, um, because vision and mission are very important, that your vision is the someday, it's the dreaming, it's the why, and your mission is the everyday, so it's the what and the how. And if you can get your vision right, and then live it through every day with your mission, then you're being consistent. And consistency is the key in amplifying your brand and gaining trust and gaining those strong relationships with your clients. So another really important thing for your strategy is your values. Um, they really help to guide your purpose and your personality and the proposition that we'll talk about shortly. And I just mentioned values with Nike because it's so important internally and externally and their values really run throughout everything that they do. Uh, they're really authentic to them and they just guide every action they take and every campaign that they have. And the usual values that people tend to go for are um, quality and passion and innovation, which you might actually use, which are good and it's okay to use, but you've got to really ensure that your values come from the heart of your brand and your purpose. So there's a couple of pointers here I thought were quite valuable. Um, unique, which is kind of a given, but some, you'd be surprised how many clients tend to say, oh, well, I like Apple's values. Can I be like Apple? Um, and it's great if you're, Values align with that, but if your values aren't authentic, then people can see through that. And also it means that your, you will change as your brand changes, so your values won't stay the same. So just make sure they're unique. And when I say actionable, um, it's, you know, if you're going to say that you value integrity, then you kind of have to say um, that you work to do the right thing in the, in the way that you build your products, or you work to do the right thing in the way that you treat your employees. So your values really need to be actionable um, and meaningful as well. So um, they need to, again, not just be something that you think you believe in, for example, Apple core messages, <clears throat> they need to be meaningful so that your company will fight for them. There's something that will just run throughout everything in the way that you treat people or the way that you want your services to be perceived. Um, and the last one I think is important is timelessness, not just in the fashion sense of using fashionable words, but your business and your, uh, especially it nowadays, your business and your um, customers will probably change, but your core value should always, always, always stay the same because they've come from the heart and it's exactly what drives your brand and your purpose and your, your mission. So consistency is the key. Um, so Nike again quickly, you know, their values are community, sustainability, diversity and social responsibility. And if you think about their values and their mission and their vision, it's all of those words have been used. Um, you know, they created an, a diverse global team. They make an 
impact, positive impact communities. So um, these core values just really resonate with their core audience, but also with every action that they take. So positioning, um, it's what makes you unique um, and valuable to your audiences. And it's, it's a really hard one to do because you've really got to understand what your consumers want and also if your product fits. So this is where, even if you're a startup or you're a kind of an established brand, you should have um, already have done some market research. So you know what your customers want. Um, you can then tell if your, your brand capabilities will fit within that. Um, and then you'll also see kind of what the world of your competitor is and how you can, posi can position yourself within that. So if you haven't done um, a competitive analysis, then you really need to do that. So for example, baked beans, which we all love, um, it's just a really simple example that the, here the baked beans have positioned themselves on pri price point, even though they're the same product and they, some of them do taste slightly different. They're talking to a completely different target audience. So Heinz beans and Branston's, which are my favorite, not because of taste, it's just that I've automatically gone to them because I like the brand. Um, but then you've got the kind of more um, cost effective brand that people go to because they think they're more value based. So even though it's the same product, they've really thought about where they are with their value proposition. Um, and just a quick tip on when, when you're doing your proposition, a really good way to write it is just think of three key words. So again, with Nike, um, they are authentic, athletic and performance. That's their three key proposition words. So they maintain their authority, authenticity, sorry, with kind of their brand values. Their products and services are all athletic based. So it doesn't mean kind of running up a mountain. It just means, you know, walking down the street, whatever your movement goal is. Um, and world class performance. So everything that they do, every touch point they do is innovative. So they try and be best in class. So the three words help. Um, the next thing is your story and storytelling is kind of quite old in the sense of marketing, but it's, I think at the moment, it's really coming to the forefront because everyone's on social media, they can talk about your brand, but also in the current climate, everybody is their touch points with your brand because they can't meet you or they can't go into shops quite as, as, as much. So um, your brand story really is important and it's a great way to communicate your values. So a quick tip to define yours would be who founded the business? What, what was it set up to do? And what was that spark? So just think of how you can tell that story creatively. And sometimes just get, getting some words that are from your mission and vision and getting copyrighted to help you do that will then just really create something that's inspirational and help inspire you and your audience. Um, a good quick example, which is not Nike, but it's Tom's, is the... Uh, the founder of Tom's Shoes um, noticed when he went traveling that a lot of kids didn't have any, any shoes and, and kind of the hardship that they faced with that. So he set up a shoe company, which a saturated market. The designs weren't specifically different. The value wasn't different. The price points were the same. But because he had a good story behind it, because every shoe that he sold, he would then give a, make some shoes for children in need. Um, it meant that he could get into the marketplace and, and just really engage with quite a large base audience. So here, his story solves the problem. It has the hero, which is the founder, and it does good. So those three things resonate in the story. And then the story will pull through to your messaging. And again, I've put consistently consistent. Um, and again, I don't mean the, your message doesn't need to be the same sentence again and again throughout all of your campaigns or your materials. But just thinking of the same tone of voice and the way that you speak and pulling through those key words and having a message toolkit. So for example, having your um, elevator pitch, which is a 20 second discussion on you know, what your offering is. Um, to your tagline, which like Nike is just do it. But that's, again, something that pulls through your values. It's all about um, the consumer. It's all about your goals and all about the fact that everyone can achieve what they want to. So as with your positioning, just think about your relevance to your audience. Um, 
and don't overpromise anything in your messaging because people all always know if you're being honest and authentic and again incorporate everything across your communications so your website your marketing collateral your product packaging so that consistency is real really key and people just get that conversation going with you um, so finally you can logo now so once you get all of those elements done you can start looking at all the lovely pretty elements um, and all the tangible things that are the representation of your brand um, you know so that's your logo your color palettes and and your tone of voice as well so it's verbal um, and this is what everybody wants to do and i know this is what the guys going to talk about now um, and once you've got all of this in place you can create some really good tactics and branding and marketing campaigns um, with every, all the elements that we've talked about. And ju I just wanted to quickly talk about how it, it applies now because, you know, we are in a kind of unprecedented time and financially people are in different places and companies are in different places. And even though you're a startup or you've been going for a hundred years, whatever, you, you know, it would be a good exercise to revisit your brand strategy and look at your positioning um, you know what's the emotional investment in your brand have your company goals shifted or has your audience changed you know how can you talk to them um, and once you kind of ask these strategic questions then you know it, it really helps you to think of the best approach to and stay consistent um, and just keep those strong relationships going with your audience and build your brand um, so that is it. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Vicky. Um, I mean, it's, it's really interesting, the, both the story side, but also the value side. And, you know, certainly when um, talking to businesses, talking to employees who work in companies, values and authenticity seems to be something that's really kind of coming through at the moment because of the difficult times that we're going through on so many different fronts. So um, that's fantastic. And I think, you know, a, a, I've got notes here to go away and do for our own business. So I'm sure <laughs> our, our audience are doing the same. Um, I'll quickly hand it, us across now to Nassis, um, who is going to talk about um, good design. So um, I'll put you in Nassis' safe hands. Excellent, thank you. I'm just gonna share my screen uh, quickly. Can you see my screen all right? Yes, great. Brilliant. Um, so yeah, so my name is Narcisse. Um, just a quick introduction, just to, uh, I was born in Barcelona, but I've worked mostly in, in London since uh, 14 years ago. And I've been working in graphic design for over 10 years. And I started my own business about five years ago, and I've been working with big businesses like Molton Brown or, um, or Amazon, and then a smaller, a smaller businesses like the Bright Harvest, um, Alice pointed earlier. And what I'm going to be talking about is um, about what is good design, uh, why it's important, and then I'm going to give you like some. I'm going to try to give you like a little bit of some values with tips and tools that you can actually apply yourself, um, which hopefully will will help you to to improve the your brand and and designs. So I uh, quite like the Steve Jobs um, uh, quote, uh, which he basically says, uh, design is not just how it looks or how it feels, but it's how it works. And I think that is actually a, a big true. Most people says that design is making things pretty, but I think design is before making things pretty, um, it's um, thinking who is the final user. So. Um, just not what you like, but what the person that this design goes to, um, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna like. Uh, the other thing that design has to do is solve a problem. So when, when someone comes to me, they, they I try to get as much um, information as possible. So understanding the brief, what's the problem that we're trying to solve, and finally, design has to be functional. It has to work, as Steve Jobs says. Um, because otherwise it's not good design. Um, my friend Lydia always says, uh, making things pretty is the easier part because once you've achieved all the, all the above, it kind of 
answers the uh, answers the the prettiness because you you've, you've already aiming to that final user. Um, why is it important? Um, well, um, design is important because it builds trust. So if you think that if you if you have like someone that comes with a really nice brochure, you automatically feel like that person it. It knows what he's talking about. When someone comes, like when a builder comes, scruffy, and you you kind of scared that it's going to do like a cowboy job. So that's that kind of uh, what design, what that, uh, what design does, and um, it gives like perception of value. Um, so when you show your design, it should be uh, coherent with your with your pricing. Um, so if if you think like Gucci and all this. Uh, luxury brands they all have like that uh, luxury feel which is is then you automatically know how much you're gonna have to be paying for um, brand confidence I think this is quite an important one because when you um, when you run your own business you you kind of uh, feel like um, that, that you need you need confidence to, to talk about, who have like that authority to speak about um, whatever, whatever is your subject. And I think branding gives you that because it, it kind of, it's like when you dress with a, with a suit, you kind of feel empowered. And then employee pride, which is uh, similar to brand confidence, but it's basically helping your employees to engage with the brand. So if you think um, when, when you go to Starbucks, all the employees, in everywhere in the world, they kind of uh, give you the same brand experience. So they'll write the, your name on the app and they'll, they'll shout and they'll have like the, the same kind. And that is through that training um, that they get, um, which, which kind of gives um, that brand experience. Um, so how do you achieve uh, good design? So I'm just gonna speak, um, about consistency, um, as Vicky, Vicky has given me the, the, an easier job because it's quite difficult to express what consistency is. And actually, when you look through Nike's uh, consistency um, exercise, is actually um, a lot, a lot clearer. What I've done in here is that consistency basically is that when you go to a networking event, you give your business card. And then these people go to your website. They need to feel that they're going to the same place. If my business card was blue and then my website was yellow, it would be a little bit strange. Like they would be like, oh, did I type the wrong um, address? And I think that's, that's what consistency is. Like something that when you look at one asset of the brand or, the, or, or design, you know that belongs together to another. And then coherence, which... Um, uh, it's it's to do with if you it's it's basically to do that if you're tr working on an organic brand uh, don't don't give like a geometric design harsh design because that kind of doesn't ex speak the same language so you, you just trying to be coherent with with the the way you speak and the way you you look. Um, one of the basic elements of design is the line. It's basically anything is a line. A drawing is, is a line. And um, lines are quite important on design. With lines, you can emphasize a, 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 a bit of text or you can organize your text just dividing it into different groups of ideas. And also it helps guide the, guide the eye. Um, lines doesn't need to be that straight. Um, I, I, my brand is quite geometric, so that's why they nice and clean, but you can actually use like a line that's a little bit more rough, more uh, organic, more, more human. Um, another element of design is color. Um, color is possibly one of the most important ones because um, A, not only catches the eyes, but also helps uh, express an idea. So for example, um, brands that they read, they, they're talking about excitement, they're talking about passion. Um, pink usually is, um, is thought for uh, female, female brands like Barbie, or if you look at green, it's for organic brands um, or, or that natural feel. Uh, blue is a very good color when you're trying to project trust or a little bit more conservatism and yellow um, it's also excitement new um, 
fresh. Uh, now, With, now uh, Nassus, just quickly, yes. sorry to interrupt you. Your presentation isn't moving on. Um, oh. I, it just, I don't know whether... Uh, oh, that's not good. Just, I know you've done some lovely slides, so uh, there we go. Is that moving that on? Was, yeah, now okay. it is, yeah. Fine, so I'll... Great. <laughs> Sorry about that. We'll share this, the slides afterwards anyway, so people can have a look through those specific ones. So, so yes, yeah, so I was talking about consistency. Um, line. So I was talking about color. Um, and so, yeah. So a couple of concepts of color theory, which um, it's good that now I can show you because otherwise I was going to point some bits in here. Um, one of the, th one, two things important. One is uh, we've got uh, a screen colors and print colors. And this is quite important uh, because they, th you need to try to match them uh, um, on screen and on, on paper and they behave differently as well. So one is called RGB and usually comes like with three numbers or with a hashtag F something uh, with numbers and letters. Um, and then the other important or interesting uh, concepts on, on, theor on color theory is uh, the color wheel. So color wheel is really useful when you're trying to match. So matching colors is one of the most difficult um, um, things to do when, when you're trying to find like two different colors that they're not the same as the other brands. And so um, you can always use a colors that they analogous, which means that they want to next to each other, or you can use complementary colors, which, which kind of helps to, to match some of the colors. A very cool tool that um, I find very useful when I'm, when I'm designing a brand and trying to find different color, um, colors it's the adobe uh, color uh, tool it's a free it's a free tool and you can actually use um use to find different ways um different colors so if you want like a monochromatic or if you're trying to do like analogous or, and then you can just move like those little uh toggles you can also as well upload like a picture and, and get the, the color of a picture if you if your brand is based on on some sort of of imagery the the next uh element or the next uh, um element of design is typography and typography is um again another of the big uh boxes of of design and every 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 um, text like colors express different every font like the colors express a little bit of difference so I've just put like here the basic the the typical uh, font so the sans the serif fonts which is the ones that they have like these little endings here these fonts are usually for uh, use for cl for classic design um, they're very good for readability so um times new roman for example is, is a very good typography when you're trying to write a lot of text and a small because it's got like bigger eyes and it's got these little um serifs that kind of continue and help readability um if you're trying to find something a bit more modern uh, sans serif or without the little uh, endings um is the, is the font that you need. It's the typical Arial that most people know. Gives you, uh, it's a, a clean design, um, quite modern. Um, if you want something that is modern, but at the same time a strong, um, uh, a, slab, a slab serif is quite good, which is called like this really thick endings. Now this font is not good for, for body text because it's, it's too, um, too heavy, but it's really good to highlight or for titles. And then when you're looking for a, a design that is a bit more human, you can use a script font. And then there is the fantasy or the, or the display fonts, which there is lots, lots of them. And um, you, can, you can use them. Uh, you tend not to use them because they give a lot of personality and they kind of detract from most brands, but unless it's, it's specific to your brand, um, it's possibly not that relevant. 
Um, and obviously there is comic sans, which a lot of people hate. Um, I'll just put this, this example here. Why do you don't want to use like fantasy fonts or display fonts or even comic sans, which comic sans apart from being overused, gives connotations of child, childish. And that's why um, you try to avoid comic sans to write big blocks of text because typography at the end of the day is to give uh, to, to give readability to, to the user. So that's quite, um, that's kind of the uh, classifications of fonts. Fonts are really good for, uh, to create hierarchy. Um, I usually recommend my clients to stick to one or two fonts, one maybe for titles, one for body text, because if, if you put lots of fonts, what's gonna happen is that you're just gonna get a very messy uh, design. Sometimes if the design needs it, sometimes you can use more, but usually one or two, it's possibly more than enough. Um, and uh, in this, in this um, paragraphs, I just put some of the concepts of fonts that, um, of typography that they're quite um, important to know. So kerning, for example, is the space. Uh, first of all, tracking is the space between the letters and it's always the same. But if you're talking about between letters, um, which they're changing because it de depends on the shape of the letter, will need to be closer to, to, the, to, the, um, to one letter or, no, or another. That's called kerning. And kerning, um, it's one of, when you, when you get free fonts, usually kerning is the one that you see uh, several problems. So for example, in this one, I just, I just forced the kerning to read by, in here you kind of, instead of reading kerning, you nearly read K, R, and uh, knee and G. So, so that's something to, to look at uh, when, when you're looking at, at fonts. Um, the leading is the, the space between lines. And when it's really, really tight, it kind of makes it really difficult to read. But also when it's very loose, it kind of makes it a little bit difficult to, to read as well, because it kind of feels like it's poetry. It's like reading lines. So, so and usually the optimal, it's possibly fine. You don't really need to do anything. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's something to look at. I've put here a, an orphan, um, which is basically when you finish, a, uh, when a paragraph starts with the end of the, for the last paragraph, which it kind of um, breaks the credibility. So you're kind of reading here and then you think that this is over and then this is a new paragraph and it's actually the continuation. So something to look at when you're designing. And I've also put here like a little widow, uh, which is like a, this word that it's by itself, which is also, also uh, nice when you, like if you, if you bring by down, um, it would kind of help um, the, make it a little bit more pleasant. Um, these posters are typography from Anthony Bur Burrell. That is, it's a, a very famous typographer. A good tool for free fonts, um, it's Google Fonts. Um, they're free and lots of them are very well designed. So, uh, um, and then you save problems with licensing, um, which li uh, fonts are, you, every font should have a license per computer. So. Um, in Google Fonts save that, that issue. Um, image, imagery is another, Im, another important part of the design. Um, in here, I've just put like a, a, a set of lots of different images. Um, it's important that you get like a consistent imagery. For example, I've, um, if you're trying to, to create an, an image, uh, like simplicity, uh, it, you should kind of follow the same design. So I've, I've put here a couple of, of design. This is a little, a little bit of a game of matching. But to make things, uh, imagery com, um, consistent, uh, good, good ways would be either convert them into black and white or adding like a, 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 a little uh, bit of your brand. So it kind of makes it all like a collection of images. Otherwise, sometimes it looks a bit odd. And two tools for images. Uh, one is an splash. It's got lots of free uh, images that you can use. And Lightroom from Adobe, again, a free 
a free tool where you can change the color, you can change the light, and you can kind of create a, like that consistency. So maybe getting all of your images a little bit unsaturated. So then you, you create like a whole consistent Im images. Um, finally, I'm gonna talk a bit about layout. So in here, I've just created um, two uh, very basic layouts just to speak about a, some of the concepts of layout. In, in, on your left, you can see that one is more pleasant than the, the right one. And I'm just gonna explain why um, this happens. The left one uh, has a grid where you follow. So then you can align things, um, which makes, uh, uh, it makes it pleasant to your eye and, and it, it, then it makes it less uh, messy. And then proximity is really uh, another important element or another important concept, which you can create like blocks of, of information. So you've got like this uh, header and subheader together. And then if you're interested, then you read the, the body copy and then you've got at the bottom like the CTA or um, white space, unlike a lot of people think is quite important. Um, giving breathing space to, the, to your designs also helps the user not to get overwhelmed with design and also it kind of gives like uh, one order so you don't you don't have to explain a lot it kind of guides the eye to to the right place and then contra contrast is when when you just use like a contrasting colors you can do it with fonts you can do it with different types of fonts and contrast helps um, to create uh, to call the attention so if you have like an advert and you explain something but you want them to do something at the end you just kind of use like contrast to to do to create a, a cta um and basically um, i'm just re-showing this so this one for obviously it hasn't got the alignment it hasn't got a lot of the elements it's very um it hasn't got white space so that's that's kind of the reason a good tool for that is Canva. Um, you can create some templates, and then if you create your templates with your fonts, with your colors, with your um, different um, elements that we've just spoken about, you can create that consistency. And then Canva is quite, uh, the free tool is quite good. Um, gives you like the, si the right sizes, and you can use it also for print. So that's it. Um, if you have any questions, you can always reach me. Great, thank you so much indeed. I mean, that's a really good tutorial to, in good design and, um, and some nice tips there at the end as well. So thank you for that. Andrew, I'm gonna pass over to you next. Yeah. Um, I'll let you sort of share your, your screen. Um, I think we'll have to stop sharing this one. That's it, great. Um, I see Carol's put up her hand. Carol, if you want to ask some questions, there are, they'll come to Q&A just at the end after Andrew's finished. Um, doing his slides and presentation um, and there's a couple of questions coming through so we will come to them very very shortly um, but uh, I'm going to hand over to, to Andrew now. Okay great so, okay um, okay can you see the screen okay? Okay. Great. Great. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Well, I'll make this quite quick. <laughs> um, um, so, my name is Andrew Whittle, and along with my wife Sarah, we run the World Design Studio. Um, basically, our main—I'll uh, just give a quick intro. But our main areas cover branding, um, it, uh, illustration, and just a point on illustration that's not been covered so far is it can play a powerful part in your branding. And one that's often overlooked, you know, everyone will go for photography, etc. But illustration is quite powerful. If you think about brands like Mailchimp, they've introduced quite loose illustrations into the brand. Um, so, yeah, something to really think about. And another area of the business that we um, focus on is digital, so everything from websites, etc. Um, and luckily enough, we get to do this in beautiful Cornwall. Um, as our own brand, you know, we don't shy away from who we are. You know, it's the two of us, and um, we work with clients all over the UK and Europe, and we get to do that next to the beach. So, 
we kind of tell that story as part of our brand as well. Um, it's easy to say you're the big agency, etc., but you know it's, it's about being transparent. That's the way we. Uh, that's where we go. And basically, what I just want to cover is um, your logo and um, people's misconception. And this has been covered already today that everyone thinks their logo is their brand, well, it's not. Um, being authentic and being honest, you know, just be you. Um, you know, people buy from people, you know, in most cases. And telling your story and adding value. And how to maintain and develop your brand. So I'm taking a slightly different angle on this. I'm, I'm going to show um, two projects that we've, um, two brands that we've worked on and how, um, you know, the style of the logo and the brand illustration, etc., really helps tell the story and positions a brand. So as we know, and as we've already talked about, you know, your logo is not your brand. Your logo is just an identity, it's just your identity, you know. Um, People think that with a logo, it should tell the customer what you do. And, and again, that's, that's not entirely true. You know, we got clients asking for a logo and they want X, Y, and Z in the logo. Um, and all you do is you just send mixed messages and you end up with a terrible looking logo. So keep it clean, keep it sharp. And um, you can introduce obviously colors, um, the font style, etc., just to set the tone of your brand and your logo. So once we've gone through the whole strategy um, parts of a brand design, um, we look at the, we, we kind of create a mood board. So we worked with a brand here in Penzance, um, called Stacey Man Estates, and it was important for them to really stand out. A lot of estate agents, if you look at any town, any city, they're all pretty much the same. Uh, bright colours, very simple um, graphics, etc. Now, what Stacey Mann wanted was something unique, something that says, you know, country living, and um, they're selling properties down here um, by the beach. You know, they're selling a lifestyle, not just a house. So that forms part of their story. So we developed a whole lot of content for their website recently. Um, current areas around Penzance and West Cornwall. So they really are selling selling a lifestyle. We lots of colours, we lots of fonts, textures, etc. So what we did was we looked at their competitors in the West Cornwall area. And this is something you should constantly do, you know, not just at the start of a branding project. Um, so if you look at these logos, um, they're quite simple. Um, nothing really differentiates them from anybody else. So we wanted to create an elegant looking brand. So this is the kind of design that we um, introduced for Stacey Man, And it's gone down really well and it's contributed to a really big growth for them. They pretty much um, cater for the majority of the market down here now. Um, so we've introduced the illustration of the, of the uh, bird, um, a nice, strong icon that can be used just for social media. And that's something interesting. That's something a lot of people don't think about. When you design a logo or a brand, you don't think how that's going to be used online. How is it going to be used as a social media icon, for example? We looked at the colour palette. Uh, the, the, the typography is quite classic. Um, we didn't go for a, a plain font, you know, we wanted to kind of get that kind of style across, very elegant looking identity. And when you compare it to the other competitors, it, it's miles apart. Um, so the for sale sign here, you know, um, we looked at all the for sale signs in and around uh, Penzance, West Cornwall, they all pretty much look the same, so we went for something, something a bit more elegant. We introduced illustration into the, um, the four cell sound. So there's a, a repeat pattern of the keys there. And that's used throughout their brand. It helps tie everything together from the website. They've got it as wallpaper in the office um, to on the window. Um, so it helps tie everything together. And it's probably one of the projects we keep getting asked about all the time because it's quite a physical brand down here in Cornwall. 
so the Chesterfield um, couch, you know, it's, it's very elegant, very fitting, copper, black, etc. Yeah, it can also adds value as well, making sure it's consistent. I know we've covered this already, but making sure everything's consistent is absolutely key. Um, as um, has been said before, you know, you had a business card out, it's completely different than, than their experience online. They're going to think they're you know, dealing with somebody else. You know, so making sure it's consistent online. So, you know, we've introduced the key graphics into the website, the colours, the fonts. The logo, now, the logo on the website is stats slightly different than the main logo. The main logo, the text is stats underneath, but there's a, there's a version of the text to the right. So when you develop a brand and a, an identity, a logo, etc., make sure it's versatile. You know, it can be used in different formats. So on the website, you can see it's, it's used in slim format there, so it can reduce the height of the header. Um, but the shield icon can be used as a social media icon or an Instagram or uh, etc. Um, you don't have to show the full name. Um, and another, another tip on logo design <laughs> kind of goes against the way what most people think, but it, it doesn't always have to tell people what you do. If you look at most logos, taken out of context on the own, they don't do anything. When they're in context, or with, whether they're with photography or illustration or text, etc., you know that tells a story. That's the brand, you know, not just the logo. Like um, Vicky said, it is just the tip of the iceberg. It's your identifier. That's all it is. So, looking at another brand here, uh, Pembroke Yarns. It's another brand down here in Cornwall. Um, Pembroke Yarns and um, specialise in. Um, hand dyed, hand spun yarn. And it's a unique brand. Um, there's so many companies out there doing something similar, um, but it's a loose illustration of a sheep or a ball of yarn or something like that. So typical, you know, exactly what you'd expect. Um, so what we wanted to do was um, play on the fact that here, um, here in Pembroke Cove, this is the Cove here, um, it's got lush colours, greens, blues, etc. And we wanted to get that into the into the identity, into the brand. So if you look at the logo, um, the shape of it uh, represents uh, the final product. And we've taken colours from the code here. Um, and also because we've got a blend on there, also does suggest like the middle image there of um, hand dyed, you know, mixing the colours. And that really helps tell the story and set the tone for the brand. And then, again, it's just being about authentic and being honest and being, you don't pretend it's something bigger than what you're not, you know. And, and here, you know, the, the product photography, you know, it's shot on the farm here in the cove. And um, you can see the, the inspiration that's been used for um, the colours of the fibre. And... A big part of um, Pembroke Yarns is not so much playing on the fact that it's in Cornwall, it's just telling that story. So anything that goes out, you know, goes out in the post. Um, it's accompanied by a really nice car that's made in Cornwall. And, you know, if you go onto the social media feed, it tells that whole story, that whole process from start to finish. And that's pretty much adds a lot of value to your business. If you can show your process, so here it shows, you know, picking the nettles, um, cooking the nettles, and then hand dyeing the fiber with the nettle color, um, and then showing it on the bobbin, and then sharing it on social media for people to comment. You know, again, all adds to being authentic, sharing your story, adds value, and, people can realize what goes into a product and, and you can apply the same thing to pretty much anything. You know, um, if, you're, if you're a small business, get your story out there, share it, add value, and um, yeah, you'll do, you'll do well. And in terms of, just again, just saying what Vicky was saying and Leslie was saying, just be consistent. Make sure your brand design is consistent from the, 
in, in Pemba Fionn's case, the card that goes out, making sure that's consistent to your social media feed, um, to the website, um, and all the rest of it, to the packaging, make sure it's all consistent. And then when someone re receives that product, you know, they, 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 they realize they get good value for money and, and they buy into it. So I've kept that quite short because I know we're running short on time. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you, Andrew. I mean, that imagery and photographs definitely makes me want to be in Cornwall right now. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that, that's, that's, that's part of the story. You know, people mm. buy that fibre from Cornwall because they buy into it. And, and the feedback that we get is um, a lot of Americans buy into that. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it definitely was making me feel that and some lovely um, designs there. And it's fantastic that we've covered both sort of strategy, words, colour. Um, there are some questions coming flying through. And I'm also conscious Vicky has to leave in um, four minutes now so i've been tracking that time so thank you andrew for keeping that time <laughs> so let lauren do you want to fire out some questions yeah and then um, um uh we can then go from there so we've got a question through from patrick who said do you think that the brand story is something that should feature in an email campaign I'm not sure who'd like to take that vicky do you want to take that question and then you probably have to leave us Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I think, um, as you know, as we've all said, the brand story will feed through to your messaging and that needs to be on everything. And it needs to be written specifically for those platforms, for your, you know, your, your, your Pinterest, your Facebook, your LinkedIn, your email. So your story um, should be on everything you do down to the, the kind of three worded positioning and your tagline. Um, it, it needs to be on everything. It's, it's the kind of conversation that you have with your audience. So yeah, it's really important that it's, it's in your email, especially. Great, thank you. And there's one more question for I've got a few for everyone as well. So we've got a question from Jenny who said, is there a common rule on what comes first, design, layout or copy? Who'd like to take this one? I'll take it. Um, I think I think it's a trade-off. I think it depends what's more important, whether the, the copy, like if you're trying to design like something that's very visual, sometimes it's good to start with the design and then fit the copy in. But if you're trying to design something that where the copy is more important, then you, you kind of have to design with the copy in mind. It, it, when, when, when copy comes, um, and I'm guessing the, the Andrew and Vicky will have the same thing. Sometimes you just get like some of the copy half written and then you start designing and then they change the whole copy and then there's like twice as much as copy. So I think it depends on what, what is the size of the project, whether it's one page or double page or, and how you can fit the, the, the copy. And then it's always like a, 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 a trade off whether can we cut a bit of copy here or, or so it depends. It depends what, what's more important. Yeah, we, we work on a lot of print work and um, with, with copy, we always say, you know, try and nail the copy. It doesn't have to be final copy, but the amount of copy. And, you know, you don't want to design, you, you, you don't want to design or write your copy based around the number of pages of a brochure. It should be the other way around, you know. You know, uh, d design the brochure around the content. The same applies to a website no matter what you do. So don't have to be final copy at the design stage, but just a, a flavor of it and some, you know, an idea of the amount of copy that's going to be, going to be used. And also knowing what you want that copy to achieve, that, that really helps. <clears throat> so if you, you know, before you even write, it's almost a brief stage, isn't it? That you, you, if you say, what, who's it talking to and what do we want it to achieve for that audience? then you can do either do the design first and fit the copy around that or vice versa. So it's kind of the goal needs to be agreed or approved or sort of first before the content or design even starts. It does. It does. I agree because you, you might want to pull out quotes. You might want to pull out facts and figures, you know, call to action. You might butcher that text beyond the client's original text, you know, um, to work within the design. It, it plays a massive part in the design of a brochure or a website.
the copy. And and, and again, don't um, you don't not, you don't need a heap of copy. You know, if you design a brochure, you know, use white space. To your friends don't feel like you've got to fill every bit of white space on a page because you know white space with your friend it helps guide the user. Agree. Right. Um, this is a question actually for all of you, but it, during Andrew your presentation, um, you incorporated the design into the, your client's office for Stacey Mann. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really lovely where, you know, I often go to a client's offices and I see the whole brand across the office and it really kind of builds that sort of view. Now with everyone working from home, how do businesses maintain that? What little tips could you give from a design point of view that could make people still feel that they're part of something, um, even though they're all sitting in their kitchen, living rooms or home offices? Yeah, I mean, if you take Pembroke Yards, for example, you know, you know they work from a farm in the cove here, you know, and again, don't pretend you're bigger than what you are, you know, and, and you don't have to have a fancy office. And, and this is, you know, what's happened over the last few months, you know, people are, are used to now Zoom and working from home and I'm the dog in the background, the kids, etc. you know, and just be honest and be authentic, you know, that, that branding can, that can be um, applied to your email signature, you know, how you conduct your Zoom and all the rest of it, you know, there are bricks and mortar businesses that, you know, they're here to stay, you know, um, it's just about being consistent across everything really. Um, there is a nice touch on the Stacey Mount, to be honest. The office looks really cool, you know, there's, there's pheasants and the red little tires with the pheasants on, and, you know, and we do all sorts of other illustration work for them through to, you know, Christmas cards and all the rest of it, but everything's based around, you know, the pheasant and, and their brands and whatnot. And yeah, it's come down really, really, really well here in Cornwall. And you, you drive your pens out, so you see uh, Stacey Mount boards everywhere. So they're doing something right. <laughs> it's a lovely brand. Really lovely. Great. I think and then, um, sorry, go on, Vicky. I was going to say, Alice, that I've just had a, a client recently who's a coach and she's had to move everything online. Um, so what we've done with her brand, and it's really subtle, is she's had some photographs done, but also when she's coaching online, she wears specific colours that her brand. So it doesn't have to be fancy, but sometimes she has a mug and um, it, like a, a specific top color that she wears and things like that. So people associate, because she is the brand, people associate her with that. Um, you know, it, it, it makes her feel that it, it's part of her organization and things like that. So even little subtle tiny things like that can make a difference at the moment when you've not got physical space. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a lovely touch um, to have that sort of sense of identity. And then um, I know it's sort of sometimes it's, uh, you know, a ch people often say working with creatives or designers are quite challenging because they're not creatives and they find it really hard to express what they're looking for to a creative. Um, how would businesses go about selecting the individual that they want to work with? <laughs> this is quite an interesting one, um, as far as I'm concerned. Um, some clients will choose someone purely on location or on price though it's a race at the bottom who can do it the cheapest um, that never never works um, they'll ask designers what's your hourly rate and that's the worst thing you can ask a designer because an inexperienced designer may charge 20 pounds an hour uh, you know the fresh out of college university charge 20 pounds an hour uh, and then they'll get a response from a more um, established designer who may charge £60 an hour and they'll go with the cheapest. But they don't realise that younger designer may take twice as long, if not three or four times longer than the experienced designer and it ends up costing them a lot more money. So asking a designer what their hourly rate is, forget it. It's not even, forget it, it doesn't really work. You know, look at their, look at their work. Um, your website should showcase, so make sure you've got good varied work on that as a designer and a client you know, may say, well, you've not done a specific brand in the same sense that we operate. You know, a lot of designer, designers and agencies will work in specific sectors, so manufacturing, engineering, etc., or leisure tourism. But I, think, I think the sense of a good designer is it doesn't matter what sector is approaching you, 
you know, you still tackle it in exactly the same way. You still immerse yourself in what their business is. You know, you get under the skin and find out, you know, what that business is all about and how and where they operate. So don't dismiss a designer if on their website they haven't got a particular piece of work that matches, you know, because you want to be going to a designer for something unique. As long as it solves a problem, you know, and that's what design is all about, you know, that's the main thing. Yeah, I think it's, a, it's also kind of establishing a person-to-person -person relationship. And I think sometimes you, uh, you get some clients where you straight away know that we're not a good, a good match just because our personalities are not the, the right thing. And sometimes you just go for a coffee or, or a Zoom call nowadays um, with a client that it's kind of a perfect match. It's like, uh, yeah, just... You do, you know, you know pretty much straight away, as soon as you have that, that first phone call with them, you, you know if you're on the same way with them, and, and, and you just know, you know, if, if you're struggling on that first, uh, first phone call, Zoom or Skype, etc., you know it's not going to work. And, and again, as a designer, this is a, you know, advice for designers, don't be, don't be afraid to say no. Because mm. as a brand yourself, that one that adds value. Don't be, don't be scared of saying no. If it's not a right fit, then it's not good for you, nor is it good for the client. Sure. Absolutely. Vicky, I know you've got to go off to a meeting, so if you need to slip off, thank you so much indeed for, for joining us this morning. We do have one more last question that will slip in, but I'll, Vicky, I'll, I'll let you go because I know you've got a, a meeting to go to. So thank you very much well. indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Vicky. Thank you. Lauren, do you want to ask that last question before um, we close? So a question from Patrick, is there a general rule for having logos with holding devices in the sense that some logos are put in a small square or a circle and some aren't? Um, does it mean anything, does it mean anything or convey anything specific? It, it doesn't convey anything specific. Um, when it comes to design, everything's either, you know, a square, a circle, etc. Um, when we design logos, we make sure we design within a frame of like, a, like a square because you know, so if you take the Stacey Mann logo for example, it's got the shield or you, the Penworth, you know, it's got the logo. It might not look like it's in a square, but we've designed it with a square in mind, so purely so that it can, it can work on social media. If you design something quite long, you know, it's not going to work in square format on social media. Even though on social media, Instagram or LinkedIn, it's a round circle. Well, it's kind of not. You're still working within a square. Instagram or, or LinkedIn is just popping it into a circle. Um, so I think I said this earlier on, you know, the Stacey Man icon, you know, that works in a square, in a circle, you know, without the words. And you don't need to include the words on social media, just the symbol, just the icon. But yeah, try not to design logos that are in a long rectangle because you're gonna you, you're gonna you're gonna come up against it, you know, straight away as soon as you want to put that on uh, on social media. Yeah, I think as well you have to think that sometimes you, if you design something that's very vertical or very horizontal, you're gonna have to design something that works on the square, like you've done on the Stacey Mann website that you kind yeah. of place it on the on the side. I think you always have to have like a secondary um, logo. Yeah, well, just an elements of your logo, you know, can work. If you look at our logo, the Whittle logo, you know, the two T's, as me and Sarah, joined together, working together, you know, we take that TT out and we use that as our social media icon. Don't have to show the full logo. It's just the TT and that's all it needs. Yeah. That's a great tip. Thank you. Well, on that note, um, we must wrap up because we've gone over our, our time, but there's been so much that we've covered there. I feel like I've had an absolute masterclass on um, design and, um, and branding, which is fantastic. So thank you both indeed for, for joining us this morning um, or this afternoon, actually. Um, and we will be pushing this content out. So if anyone's missed part of it, then they can catch up on the presentation slides. Um, next week is our final part of our marketing series, uh, where we'll be covering international expansion, new markets and territories, very relevant. Increasingly, we're getting more and more projects on the work crowd um, that are global projects and global freelancers. Um, so if you are looking for some design help um, or any marketing help at the moment, we do have um, access to some fantastic uh, vetted freelancers. Um, who are all doing brilliant projects um, for our clients. We've got over 3,000 um, across this of PR, marketing, content, design space. 
So it is really a good time, I think, you know, especially in August to be rethinking, um, you know, what's the end of the year going to look like and to be re re rebooting our designs. Um, so we're saying fresh and relevant to current times. Thank you so much indeed, Andrew and Narcissus and Lauren for joining. Um, and um, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.